For over 30 years there has been significant research to improve the realism of virtual reconstructions of cultural heritage sites. From the early 3D models of IBM's Riley to the latest multisensory reconstructions, improved physical simulation of the material properties of the environment and factors such as how light and other senses, audio, feel, and smell propagate within an environment including the presence of any participating media, such as dust and smoke, have driven the increase in realism. The presence of participating media can have a significant impact on the perception of an environment. While the physical fidelity of reconstructed cultural environments is now at a very high standard, what is often very conspicuous in most reconstructions is the absence of people. When in use, an environment is never empty, it contains the people who need to be in the environment either for work or for leisure. High fidelity simulation of virtual humans, including in virtual archaeology, has been a topic that has been active for many years. Despite all this effort, virtual humans in any environment still don't look quite right. Termed the uncanny valley effect, virtual humans can elicit a substantial negative emotional response in the viewer. This can significantly affect the level of immersion that the viewer may feel in the virtual environment. In this paper we consider the inclusion of real humans in the cultural heritage reconstructions. Human reenactors dressed in period costume, and undertaking the ancient tasks in an accurate manner, are captured in high fidelity in 3D and then incorporated into the virtual environment. This enables the ancient sites to be populated while avoiding any uncanny valley effects. The rest of the paper is structured as follows. Section 2 describes the system used to capture the reenactors in 3D, and the challenges faced in doing so. Section 3 provides the context for the cultural heritage case study considered in this paper, Industries in Medieval Coventry in the UK. Section 4 presents the results of this work so far, and Section 5 discusses the remaining issues that need to be addressed and provides details of what the next steps for this research will be. 2. High Fidelity 3D Capture Recent advances in depth capturing technology, such as the Microsoft Connect Azure and photogrammetric techniques, have made it now possible to capture and subsequently display in great detail, volumetric videos, VVs, 3D volumes of dynamic activity. Such VVs are being increasingly used in a number of applications, including entertainment, sports, etc. Unlike stereoscopic video, VV includes all the detail of an object in 3D, enabling a viewer to examine it from any angle. Key challenges though are that capturing a dynamic object, such as a human undertaking a task, in 3D results in a lot data, and existing graphics pipelines are not well equipped to handle dynamic 3D point clouds. 2.1 The 3D System Two different 3D capture systems have been used for this work, 1, Microsoft's Connect V2S and, 2, their Azure Connects. The Connects are time-of-flight 3D sensors. Originally developed as an aid for controlling games for Microsoft's Xbox, the Connect and later the Connect V2, quickly found alternative applications in capturing 3D environments. The Connect V2 includes a 1920x1080 resolution RGB camera, a 512 times 424 pixels infrared camera, and an infrared emitter. The weaving case study, section 3.1 was captured with only 2 times Connect V2S. This was because the space in the actual environment was very limited, and thus it was only possible to capture one view of the weavers. The dyeing case study was captured with 3 times Connect V2S. The limited resolution of the RGB and infrared cameras meant that fine detail in the scene, such as the threads in the loom, were not captured. Furthermore, the Connect V2S require an independent USB 3.0 controller per device, meaning that without adding PCI expansions, the control computer can only operate a single device. This is not helpful when a scene needs to be simultaneously captured from multiple locations. Indeed, 
The official API does not support multiple devices. Although open source APIs exists to support multiple devices, there is no means to automatically synchronize or timestamp the devices, this has to be done manually after the capturing process. Microsoft discontinued the Connect V2 in November 2018. Released in March 2020, although only in the US and China, the Microsoft Azure Connect is a low-cost, $399, 3D capture device which includes a 12-megapixel RGB camera, a 1-megapixel depth camera, 360-degree 7 microphone array, and an orientation sensor. Although the frame rate of the Connect Azure, 30 FPS, is still relatively low, the high resolution of the cameras make the device well suited to capturing relatively slow forms of human motion, such as those involved in reenacting medieval tasks. The official Azure API supports simultaneous capture from multiple devices and a hardware frame capture synchronization is included. A major unsolved issue, to date, is the lack of an officially supported cable of longer than 1 meter. Cables longer than this result in lost or corrupted frames, which have to be dealt with after the capturing process. In addition, despite having an array of seven microphones on each device, there is currently no official means for accessing this data correctly, with only one audio feed per device being visible when using third-party libraries. Four Connect Azures were used to capture the tanning process in 3D. 2.2 Challenges when capturing real activities Microsoft states quite clearly in their documentation that the Connect Azure includes a global shutter that enables the device to be used in any ambient lighting condition. This was simply not the case when we attempted to capture 3D data outside, even on a cloudy day. It was necessary to enclose the area of capture in a tent in order to reduce the ambient lighting to a level that would not saturate the IR camera, and thus avoid highly noisy or even no depth data. Temporal and spatial alignment are critical when combining dynamic scenes from multiple devices. Spatial alignment is achieved by ensuring there is a static reference object in the scene that can be seen by all devices. As mentioned, Temporal alignment in the V2S had to be done manually, whereas with the Azures, there is a mechanical link cable that ensures the temporal alignment. Another important issue that has to be considered when incorporating captured VVs into a virtual environment, is the lighting conditions under which the objects were captured, and the lighting conditions that will be used within the virtual scene. Capturing the real lighting with a 360-degree HDR camera, enables this lighting balance to be achieved. 3. Medieval Coventry Originally a small Saxon settlement, by the late 14th century Coventry had grown to be one of the largest and most important towns in England, and was the regional capital of the Midlands. Its success was based on the sale of raw wool, and later manufactured and finished woolen cloth, supplemented by other important industries including leather making and metalworking. Coventry was particularly noted for its blue cloth, using imported woad for the color and alum to fix the color. Blue cloth was used in finished broadcloth or as the basis for expensive fabrics including scarlets. The phrase true as Coventry blue refers to the fact that the cloth retained its color, despite the harsh laundry practices of the time. Coventry dyers were therefore important craftsmen, along with others in cloth finishing including shearers and tailors. Some of Coventry's drapers and mercers, those who sold the wool and cloth, were amongst the wealthiest merchants in the country. The city authorities rigorously controlled the quality of the city's cloth, packaged, and sealed with the city's elephant, and castle emblem. Spawn Street, to the west of Coventry's medieval walls, was a suburban area noted for its concentrations of weavers, dyers and tanners. It was conveniently located for access to the River Sherborne, upon which tanners and dyers in particular depended for a supply of running water. Remaining tanning workshops inside the walls were required to relocate to the suburbs due to the noxious character of preparing leather, as demonstrated by surviving documentary evidence for local regulations, for example in 1461 and 1473. 
Many of the surviving medieval buildings in Coventry were destroyed during the war or taken down during post-war reconstruction. A relatively large number survived in Spon Street due to its location away from the town centre, although the construction of the ring road across the street in the 1960s involved further losses. In 1967 the City Council launched a scheme to restore some of the remaining Spon Street buildings and other medieval buildings were relocated here having been taken down from other parts of the city. Some of the restored buildings today which are now used as shops, restaurants and a museum. 3.1 Medieval Industries English wool and woolen cloth were in high demand in Europe and made up the lion's share of the country's exports in the medieval period. Coventry grew as a wool-producing town using flocks around the city owned by religious institutions including the Benedictine Priory of St. Mary, and the Cistercian Foundations at Coombe and Stoneley. By the 14th century, Coventry was also manufacturing broadcloth for the overseas and domestic markets and this turned the city into a fast-growing boom town attracting migrant workers to work in the textiles industry. The process of producing broadcloth required a large workforce, especially large numbers of lower status weavers and spinners. By the late 15th century about a third of the city's workforce, including children, was employed in textiles and textiles-related industries and over a half of the population was engaged in low-status wage-earning activities. Natural ingredients were used to make dyes of various colors in the Middle Ages, madder for red, woad for blue, much of it imported from Europe or further afield. The dyed cloth or thread was dipped in a warmed dye bath containing a mordant solution such as alum to fix the color evenly. The leather industry was essential for everyday life in the Middle Ages, for clothing, shoes and boots, tents, saddles, gloves, purses and for carrying wine. Leather making was largely for the local domestic market, although the industry's importance has been underestimated. The leather trade worked closely with the town's butchers. The smells from the tanning establishments were particularly noxious as warm bird or dog droppings were used to loosen the hair and fat from the hides, before they were scraped off. They were then treated with urine and soaked for up to 12 months in deep vats. Finally, then the hides could be dried and worked into leather. 3.2 Project Aims In 2021, Coventry will be City of Culture in the UK. Held every four years, after stiff competition, one city is chosen to showcase its cultural uniqueness. For a whole year, the city and its region put on a wide variety of cultural events, including music, dance, theatre and exhibitions. The work described in this paper will form an important part of built environment exhibition within Coventry's City of Culture activities. Held in the former Draper's Bar in the city centre, this exhibition will run the whole year of the celebrations and is expected to attach many thousands of visitors, subject to any pandemic restrictions. After the year of the Coventry City of Culture finishes, the results of the project will be used to explain the importance of medieval industries to school children as part of the medieval Coventry Charities outreach activities. Four Realistic Humans Accurately simulating human appearance and actions in virtual environments remains a challenging problem, which is exacerbated by the uncanny valley effect. To avoid this problem, and the negative impact unrealistic humans have on the perception of a virtual environment, real human activities were captured in 3D and incorporated into the virtual models. This is facilitated by the fact that across the UK there are a number of people and organizations that carry out, and indeed teach people, traditional medieval skills, such as weaving, dyeing and tanning. These reenactors play a key role in helping to preserve and pass on these skills. 4.1 Weaving Reenacted weaving was captured in 3D at the Weaver's House, 122 Upper Spon Street. One of the houses in a terrace of five cottages that was built in 1455, the Weaver's House, has been carefully restored as to how it would have been in 1540 when it was inhabited by a narrow loom weaver, John Croke and his family. 
In addition to a medieval garden at the back of the house with plants that would have been grown for food, flavoring, medicine and household use, the house also includes a detailed replica of the loom that would have been used at the time. The small room in which the loom is, was covered in green cloth to make the extraction of the loom and reenactors easier and several minutes of weaving were captured using two Microsoft Connect V2S. Weaving reenactors, Ruth and Tim Gilbert operated the replica narrow loom. 4.2 Dying Medieval dyeing was reenacted by Debbie Bamford, of the Mulberry Dyer. Established in the early 1990s, the Mulberry Dyer uses meticulous research in order to accurately recreate the dyeing process in a number of periods of history, including the Middle Ages. Examples of her work can be found in the V&A Museum, Hampton Court Palace, the Globe Theatre and other museums and historic houses across the UK and Europe. The dyeing process was captured using three Connect V2s in an office. This was a mistake, as the smell of the dyeing process, which uses horse urine, remained in the office for several days. 4.3 Tanning Four different tanning processes were captured, washing, scraping, working the leather, and rinsing. The tanners were Scott Baines and Liv of Rewild, Forest of Dean, who teach ancient skills to build awareness for sustainable rural living. Capturing the different tanning processes in 3D produced some particular challenges. While weaving and dyeing could be captured indoors, the tanning processes had to be captured outside, in particular because of the pit in which the hides are soaked, it was necessary to enclose the capture area in a tent to reduce the ambient light levels, as explained in section 2.2. 5. Discussion Once the VVs have been captured and the virtual environment modeled, the VVs need to be incorporated into the virtual environment. This is still work in progress in this project. An early result with the model of the dying house, and the VV of the actual dyeing process relit with the virtual lighting. Work is ongoing to reduce the noise in the point clouds and to develop high-quality compression methods, to enable the dynamic points clouds to be viewed in real time during a live walkthrough of the environment, using a HMD, rather than as pre-computed animations. One restriction of the current approach is that all the activities, although appearing realistic, are fixed and simply play on a loop. This prevents the viewer from interacting with the virtual character in order to find out more details of the process. Future work will investigate having some chosen interactions, so that the virtual humans can respond to certain predefined questions, and even the possibility of having a live interaction. In this case the reenactors will be carrying out the activity in a remote location. The point cloud will be streamed live to the virtual environment and the viewer can interact directly with the reenactor. Future work will also carry out a detailed user study in order to compare the perceived realism of incorporating VVs of real people into virtual cultural heritage environments with the traditional use of computer-generated virtual humans.